Guitar is not going to be what we want it to be. Oh, so be it. Uh, it's good to see you guys. It's such a huge crowd we have tonight. <laughs> All nine, ten of us. <laughs> uh, loving this weather, I hope. You know, a little, little chilly. But uh, was it saying that uh, God rains the rain on the just and the unjust all the same? And we thank him for this super El Nino wet weather we're having this winter and last winter. It's, our reservoirs have definitely needed it. Uh, but uh, was it Apostle Paul said that, uh, to be thankful in all things? And uh, so even if we're chilly, thank you, Lord, that you've given us the weather and that you've given us the, the opportunity and the ability to, to make most of our lives. And uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Everybody stand, please. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain there is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and go there with Christ, so firm on his promise I'll stand. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. All of my life in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life in every season, you are still God, I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to seek, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, 
when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received I will sow. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whispers of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways, your of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I, oh, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I, oh, I can hardly think as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Lord God, you are so righteous, holy, true, and just, and you're so worthy of all of our praise. We thank you for all that you do in our lives and for your provision, for your grace and your mercy. And we worship you, Lord Jesus. I'm sorry to sit down. You guys beat me to it. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen! Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen! Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen! Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen! Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. It all revolves around your throne. Who can know your glory? So high above, yet slain for us, you alone are worthy. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours. You're the one we bow before. Reigning over us as we lift you up, you will reign forevermore. The one who was and is to come, God of every moment, forever crowned, exalted now, you alone are holy. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours, you're the one we bow before. Reigning over us as we lift you up, you will reign forevermore. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours, you're the one we bow before. Reigning over us as we lift you up, you will reign forevermore. Glory and praise, power and strength, worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. Glory and praise, 
peace, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. Glory and praise. Power and strength, worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, worthy is the Lamb of God. It all revolves around your throne. Who can know your glory? Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so worthy of all of our praise and glory and honor. We worship you, Lord Jesus. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop 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 working. Never stop. That is who you are. 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have made a way where there is no way. That you have opened the doors that no man can open, and you have shut the doors that no man can shut. We thank you for your provision in our lives and for guiding us and leading us in your will. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Everybody stand for this last song. Everybody stand up, please. Everybody up. Thank you, guys. The angels all around you. Your people bow before you. And all of heaven will proclaim the beauty of your name the angels all around you your people bow before you and all of heaven will proclaim the beauty of your name holy 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 is the Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord Almighty. Holy is the Lord. Your light floods those around you. It washes out uncertainty. It makes us bold before our King, the Maker of everything. Your light floods those around you. It washes out uncertainty. It makes us bold before our King, the Maker of everything. We're singing, Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord Almighty. Holy is the Lord. Praise the Lamb who was slain, the Son who rose from the grave. And everything that has breath will see the glory of our King. Praise our Lamb who was slain, the Son who rose from the grave. And everything that has breath will sing 
the glory of our King. We're singing holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty. Praise the Lamb who was slain, the Son who rose from the grave, and everything that has breath will sing the glory of our King. Praise the Lamb who was slain, the Son who rose from the grave. And everything that has breath will sing the glory of our King. We're singing holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty. Holy, 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 you Lord Almighty, holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty, holy, 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 are you Lord Almighty. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Lord Jesus, you are so holy and so righteous, so true and just in every way, and that you have bestowed upon us your holiness and your righteousness, that I and myself am, am wicked, I have a wicked heart, but you have come into my life and that you have made me holy because you said I am holy because I accepted your gift. And I thank you and I praise you that you have given us the ability to walk boldly into the throne room of grace and to enter into your courts with praise and to enter into your, your presence with thanksgiving. And we thank you, Father, for all that you've done in our lives and all that you continue to do in our lives. And we worship you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's take a break uh, tonight. And, you know, people have an influence, whether we uh, believe it or not, people have an influence on us. And um, because we're human, uh, you know, but it's amazing because people can have a good influence on us or people can have a bad influence on us. And, um, you know, I think. Uh, circumstances like the people of Israel here are going to learn, and this is kind of going to be the point uh, tonight that it's faith and unbelief, and really our whole lives, everything is measured by faith or unbelief. And you know, I used to think that circumstances and environment kind of condition us towards faith or unbelief, but I don't believe that anymore. Uh, I believe that faith and unbelief are matters of the heart uh, that are then revealed through circumstances and environments. Uh, in other words, miracles, as I said Sunday, uh, seeing miracles is, isn't something that's going to produce faith. Uh, faith is an issue, or unbelief is an issue of the heart. And so all these circumstances in life, our environment, uh, the places that we're in, aren't going to build our faith or build our unbelief. They're going to reveal uh, what is in our heart because either our hearts are full of faith or our hearts are full of unbelief. And what we're going to see here tonight, which is very convicting even to me, is that there isn't a half and half. 
it's not a 50-50. Well, I'm 50% walking by faith and the other 50% unbelief. Or in other words, I believe half of God's word, but I don't believe the other half. Uh, and we may not see it that way, but really that's what we're doing. And when we believe the promises of God and they're true, every word of God is true, uh, and we believe them, but we say, yeah, but, or yeah, I know that's true, but, uh, and we throw our two cents in. So we're believing and agreeing with God, but we stop there with it and we still rest more in unbelief instead of walking in that faith. And really, this is the one thing that kept how many millions of people out of the promised land. The Bible said it was their unbelief. Uh, they chose to believe here tonight this account of the spies, uh, these 12 men that were sent in to investigate the promised land that God had told them that he was giving them. He told them it was flowing with milk and honey, and yet they still wanted to do their own investigation. And because of the report now that these spies bring back, several million people refused to go into the promised land because they were uh, more determined to be ruled by unbelief than by faith. And so our lives are no different. You know, our promised land or our uh, walking in the Spirit, walking in faith with God, every day we're tested uh, to either walk by faith or to walk in unbelief. And the more we walk in faith, the more we're going to see the promises of God. Uh, the more we're going to see the hand of God working in and through our lives. And uh, the less we walk in faith, the more we talk ourselves out of God's plans and purposes, well, then the more we're going to walk in unbelief. And the more, I think, frustrated we're going to become, the more wishy-washy, the more up and down, the more unstable we will become, and really that's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to be those men like, and women like James talks about uh, who are getting tossed to and fro all over the place uh, instead of being stable and, and founded on uh, the Word of God that is true and trusting in the Word of God. And so let's pray here tonight, and we'll get into Exodus chapter, or Exodus, I did it again, geez, Numbers chapter 13. Father in heaven, I just uh, thank you, God, for tonight, and Lord, thank you for this passage, Lord, and uh, this tremendous story of people no different than us, God, people who are challenged daily uh, to either rely and trust on the things that we see, hear, touch, and smell, maybe even those things that we know to be true because we have experienced them ourselves, but how important it is when we put that up against your word, and, and which would we choose to depend on or trust in more, those things that we've seen and heard for ourselves or the things that you have said? Well, if they ever come in contrast with one another, I believe walking in faith is to uh, even discredit those things that we have seen uh, and trusting the things that you say because uh, the Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar. And so, Father, the more we depend on ourselves or other men uh, trying to steer us in certain directions, uh, the less then we would be depending on you. Unless, of course, our thoughts and our faith line up with uh, the Word of God. But, Father, I pray that each and every day with these opportunities, God, that we would be uh, tested, Lord, as this is what the people uh, were undergoing, encountering, they were being tested. It's not that God needed to uh, be proven right or wrong, but it was that they need to be proven. What was in their hearts was going to be revealed, and how it's revealed is through these tests, through these circumstances, through these opportunities. And so, Father, teach us, Lord, because truly you haven't changed, and mankind definitely has not changed. Uh, the heart of man is still the same. And so, Father, minister to us uh, as only you can. And, Father, I do lift up Margaret and Ralph also, God. Thank you for the miracle, Lord, of Ralph rushing her to the hospital uh, quickly and, and her getting diagnosed and the clot dissolving and her resting in the hospital and doing well and all of the family there with her and uh, help her to regain her strength and uh, to be patient, God, and uh, Lord, as we all hate to hear those words from the doctors, having to change our diet a little bit and uh, these sorts of things, but 
Give her the strength and the patience uh, to do the things that she needs to do uh, to get back to full strength. And God bless Ralph, Lord, and uh, thank you for him. And what a testimony being uh, in his 70s and sleeping three nights in a row in a chair there at the hospital, uh, refusing to leave uh, his bride's side. And uh, what a man, God. But uh, thank you for him. Give him the strength. Give him rest. And as I prayed for them both, uh, that they both would experience that peace uh, that only comes from you, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And bless the family, God, and uh, just use this, Lord. Use this in a mighty way to speak to each and every one of them and to increase their faith and their hope and their trust in you. And so, Lord, bless this time now. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear, uh, Sunday, right after church, this is amazing. Uh, we had church and I was standing up here in front and a couple people came up and talked and Ralph and Margaret came around here and they were both just excited like they usually are and and they said something, I don't remember what it was, but they were, you know, thanking me, and, and it was, you know, a good message, and this and that, and then they walked out the door, and I guess on the way to the car, um, Ralph noticed that she was starting to slur a little, and, and kind of speak a little weird, and thought that she was, you know, and he even asked her, he, this is from him, after I talked to him, he's like, honey, are you okay? And she made no sense when she responded to him, so they got in the car, and he went straight to the ER. And so they walked in, threw her right, or not threw her, but put her right in a room and, and ran some tests and stuff and started uh, finding that she had a clot, started dissolving it immediately, and but still wanted to follow up and send her to Bakersfield too. Uh, so they did, and I went and saw her it was Sunday, Monday, I went and saw her Tuesday, I think it was. I think it was Tuesday. And um, the whole family was there. I mean, it was a beautiful scene, you know, beautiful picture. The family was there. I got to meet her, two of her sons, two of their sons, some aunts, some uncles. I mean, the, <laughs> there were so many people that came to see her that when I came into the security guard at the front of uh, Mercy, Sal, uh, not Mercy, it was uh, Adventist Health, Bakersfield, I went up and I just said, uh, Margaret uh, De La Cruz, and he goes, oh, Another one, you know, room 22-4, didn't even have to look in the system, right? I mean, because it was just so many people came to see her, and it was just an, a testimony, uh, their family, because a lot of their family was local, but um, a lot of them are Catholic, too. And so, you know, Margaret was having me pray there, and, you know, a couple of them got out and kind of, you know, left. But it's just an amazing thing to see, and she's doing well. Uh, last I heard, I did not talk to her today, but she's doing well. Uh, they're working on the rehab part, which she didn't like. I said, nobody likes the rehab part because they make us do things we don't want to do. And the doctor had already talked about changing some diet things around and all of that. But they're doing well. Ralph was doing well. Again, what a trooper. You know, Jenny, uh, Sedemeyer, Jerry and Jenny was there when I got there. And I was proud because I remember, I think it was with Lana or it might have been with somebody else uh, when I went to the hospital and Jenny was there and and, uh, you know, I tried to encourage Barry or whoever the other person was that was with the person that was there. It's always, oh, it was, um, it was Barbara uh, when Jim was in the hospital. There's been quite a few of us who've been in the hospital. But it was uh, when Jim, before uh, the last time he was in the hospital, this was like a year or two ago, and I remember encouraging Barbara, who was sleeping there at the hospital and the same kind of thing, and I get it, but reminding the person who is there, the loved one, to eat uh, reminding them to drink and to stay hydrated because it sounds simple to us, but when you're in that state, you're not thinking of yourself. And so I was proud, you know, when I went there that Jenny had drug him down uh, to the cafeteria uh, and they were there eating. And, and Ralph even said, this is the first time I've eaten in three days. And I'm like, praise God, Jenny. So we, you know, uh, Jenny had her mom there and uh, you know, God, God is just so good. I mean, right when I walked in to see Margaret, she just had a stroke, you know, a stroke, basically. And, you know, she's got this smile. We know Margaret. She's got just this smile, you know, and the rest of the family's like, you know, you know, like doom and, you know, not doom and gloom, but, you know, it's a serious thing, right? We don't want to see our loved one, you know, having a stroke. And, but she's smiling, and, and I go down to see Ralph, and, you know, I saw him from a distance at the cafeteria, and he just had that smile on his face, and I was like, 
you know, that's the joy of the Lord, you know, and that speaks volumes, volumes to people. And it's not a front, you know, it's not something we have to pretend to do. And it's just the joy was within them and it was not containable. Uh, and it was just a beautiful thing to see. But anyways, all that to say, keep them in prayer uh, because she's got a little bit of a road ahead, you know, building up strength and things like that. But from the last time I heard, all her faculties, everything was good. I talked to her, so there's no issues with, uh, right now anyways, her brain, you know, or, or talking. And, you know, sometimes those strokes, time is crucial. Uh, you know, minutes, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes can do some some severe um, irreversible damage, and so, you know, praise God, and, and, you know, just a miracle, you know, and I think for us as a husband and, and you know, wives, we need to keep an eye on each other, you know, uh, and, and pay attention, especially as we start getting older, you know, I mean, I'm glad he was just savvy enough and quick enough to see, and, and why is that? Because he probably had studied his wife, you know, he, he knows his wife, he knows her characteristics, he knows he knows her well enough to when something is wrong, uh, to identify it, but then to act, uh, to act on it, right? And, and so anyways, I'm done with that, but uh, keep them in, in prayer as they continue to recover and heal. And so uh, Numbers chapter 13, let's begin reading here at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself, Men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. These then were their names from the tribe of Reuben, Shamua the son of Zachor, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Horai, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunel, from the tribe of Ishkar, Igal, the son of Joseph, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun, from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, Pal Paltai, the son of Raphu, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai. From the tribe of Joseph, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gemiali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. <laughs> Why couldn't they all be nice, easy names like that? From the tribe of Naphtali, Nahi, Nabai the son of Vosh, Vo, Vo, Vosai, from the tribe of Gad, Gul, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, but Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So remember last week, uh, this event falls on the heels of a great test uh, amongst the people. I remember when uh, Miriam and Aaron uh, brought those accusations against their brother Moses and basically accused Moses of being a dictator, uh, accused Moses of being uh, full of pride, thinking that he was the only one that could lead the people. Remember, they were jealous, and uh, they wondered why they didn't have more authority and why uh, they couldn't speak on behalf of God, only Moses. And remember, God brought the three of them, then Moses and Miriam and Aaron, to the tent of meeting. The presence of God descended down, and then God called the two out and left Moses there. And God judged Miriam. And, you know, Vance asked me a great question last Thursday. You know, if the Bible says that it was Miriam and Aaron who spoke out against Moses, why did only Miriam, uh, why was she the only one struck with this plague? Uh, well, I think the Bible doesn't say specifically, but it does kind of in a way reveal something, right? Because it lists Miriam I would believe that the um, assumption, and I'm careful with assumptions, but the assumption would be that she was either the driving force or the leading force of these accusations. 
Because if it was Aaron, then I'm sure Aaron, the plague would have befell Aaron. And so fascinating, could it have been that he was just kind of, well, I'm not going to say anything kind of thing, and she's just saying all of these things, getting the people fired up, and so he was guilty by association. But what we have to understand is that if God is going to judge one and not the other, there's legitimate reasons for God judging one and not the other, regardless of gender. This isn't a, a woman and man thing. This is just simply the one who had the plague brought upon them was the one who was driving this force, who was the one who was probably had the more uh, impure heart and the motivations that was trying to get other people to believe this same lie. And so, Again, at the end, of the, day, the end of the day, we have to rest upon God's judgments are being perfect, right? When God judges, uh, he doesn't judge partially, and he doesn't judge without righteousness. And so if the plague only became the one, there's a good reason for it. But great question, because I wondered that too as I was reading through that. And so this next event falls on this, the heels of, of this, because now they're in the desert of Paran, we just read, and they're getting close to the promised land, uh, the land of Canaan. And so, if we only had the account here in Numbers 13, when I read this, the impression is, is that, okay, so God brings them to the area of Paran, and now God commands 12 of their men to now go into the promised land, which God gave them, which God told them was theirs, that they were going to possess, that was flowing with milk and honey, now send these spies in uh, to investigate, uh, to see if there is this fruit that I told you there was, to see if there were uh, cities there and, and the inhabitants of the city, if they were strong people, how was their military force, uh, if the cities are heavily barricaded, right? Uh, God wants them to send in these spies to investigate the promised land. In fact, if you read verse 3 here, it's exactly what it says. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord. But remember, we have to look at the whole context of the Bible. I think if you turn to Deuteronomy uh, chapter one, we get more context, not that there's a contradiction, but you get more of a full picture of what is going on here. Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, says this, says, Then we set out from Horeb and went through all of the great and terrible wildernesses, which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord your God had commanded us. And we came to Kadesh, Berin, I said to you, here it is, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give us. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers has spoken to you. Here it is. Do not fear or be dismayed. So God told Moses that this is what you tell the people, I have given them this land, now go up and take possession of it. God, the, the God of your fathers has spoken this to you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Look at verse 23. It says, then all of you approached me and said, let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way which we should go up in the cities which we shall enter. Now it says, the things please me. This is Moses writing this. So the picture isn't that God said, get these 12 men and send them into the promised land. The picture is God says, you need to just go up there and take it and take possession. Don't fear, don't be dismayed. But the people came to Moses and said, hey, why don't we send these spies in? But here's the problem, part of the problem, or is it? Verse 23 says, this thing well pleased me. So in other words, Moses heard this and Moses agreed with this idea. And so he says, and then I took 12 of your men and one from each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied it out. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. 
And they brought us back a report and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Verse 26, Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt away, right, with this report that they're going to bring back that we're going to read. It says, our brethren made our hearts melt away, saying the people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are larger and fortified to heaven. Does that sound like a little bit of an exaggeration? And besides, we saw the sons of Anakin there. Then I said to you, do not be shocked, nor fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son in the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way which you should go. So a little more context onto what happened there. God gave them a simple, but not so simple command. Go up and possess the land. Go up, rise up and take the land. Fear not and do not be dismayed. But the people came to Moses and said, Moses, uh, we need to send some spies out. Because, yeah, God did say this, but we need to kind of test it out. We need to make sure that what God said was right. And so Moses here, is he compromising? He, he's agreeing with this idea. And here's an interesting look into leadership. What just happened to Moses? Moses was just accused by those closest to him, his brother and his sister, of being what? Kind of like a narcissist maybe, or a, uh, a tyrant, or you know, a ruler with a strong fist, a, a proud man. And so now here comes this uh, group of people, his people, his brethren, who's coming to him now, and, and is he now hesitant uh, to be that leader of God that God had called him to be when he knew the right thing to do, but now he was hesitant because of what the people accused him of before. Now he has to kind of compromise, which I love his heart here because that's what a true leader wants to do. He's not looking to rule by force. He's not looking to rule with an iron fist. He cares about the people that he leads, but now he's hesitant uh, to lead the way that God wants him to be because of these people and him not wanting to have the people think he's this a dictator. And so he hears the people. And so I believe the picture here is, is that it then was Moses who went before God and said, okay, God, so we're going to send spies in. How would you command us now to send spies in? That's what I believe the picture is. And so now here in verse 13, it makes sense when it says, uh, that God, in chapter 13, verse 3, when it says that they went as the Lord had commanded them. How did he command them? Okay, you're going to go in, so I want 12 spies to go in. I want one from each of the 12 tribes. I want each representative from each tribe to go in. That way you're getting a full, you know, uh, spectrum of, of what you're looking at because, you know, each people group is going to be a different people group. And so God wants equal representation throughout the whole nation. So each one of you from each tribe is now going to go in and you're going to spy out or you're going to investigate this promised land. And so what an amazing thing. And really this mission uh, is going to turn out with a bad result. And so could Moses be criticized here for making the wrong decision? Well, we have to remember the bigger picture here is that God commanded them to go in. But this is where we get into these pictures in the Bible of God's sovereign perfect will, right? We'd be foolish to think that these guys pulled a fast one on God. 
like God didn't already know that these people were going to be full of unbelief and fearful of going in, though God commanded them to just go in. No, God is uh, sovereign. He knows all things. So to say that this went according to God's sovereign plan is accurate. But within God's sovereign plan, there is this very uh, movable, pliable, permissive will here. You want another example of that? How about when the people uh, came to Samuel the prophet in 1 Samuel 8, uh, verses 4 through 9, and the people were complaining and said, hey, we love you, Samuel. You're a great leader, but you're getting old, and we're, we don't want one of your kids. No offense, but your kids are knuckleheads. We don't want one of your kids ruling over us, so we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. We don't want to be ruled by one man, and especially a corrupt man, Uh, We want to be ruled like the other nations. We want a king. And what did God say when Samuel was displeased in this? Because that was God's way of wanting to lead and direct his people. And what did God say? He says, Samuel, don't be mad. Uh, The people haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And so God knew what was best for the people. But the people, God even said, give the people what they want. Right? We looked at that two weeks ago. Sometimes God, we get these uh, things that we ask for because we're persistent and they're not what God wants to give us, but sometimes God will give them to us to teach us a lesson, won't he? Uh, so that, remember, when they wanted meat and they were crying that they needed meat, so God said, fine, you want meat? I'll give you meat. <laughs> right? And the meat was coming out their noses and their ears and uh, while it was still in their teeth. Right? What happened? Well, the curse came upon them. God, sometimes if you get the things that you want and uh, it tastes like gravel uh, or it doesn't satisfy, it's probably because God is teaching you a lesson that it wasn't what God wanted for you. If it's what God wants for you, it's going to satisfy. You know, I love God's blessings. They come without regret. You see, when you get the things you want for and they come full of regret, those aren't blessings of God. Blessings of God come without regret. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing for us to experience because, again, the blessings of God come without regret. And so here, it's the same thing. God is permitting them uh, to uh, choose this permissive will, but yet God still is fully aware of all of this. So it was God who commanded them uh, to go in with these 12 spies, uh, one representative from each of the 12 tribes. So despite uh, the people and their choosing this plan, yet it was God who was commanding it. And what is he going to do with it? Just like everything else, he's going to test them with it. He's going to use their ideas and their plans of wanting to go in and spy out this land to test the hearts of the whole nation. And boy, did they fail the test and fail it miserably. And so here we go. Verse 4, he chose these 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes. Two names you should underline there. Uh, One of them is Caleb, who we're going to read about here. The other one is, um, where was it? Hoshea in verse uh, 8, the son of Nun, which it's Joshua. That's the name Joshua. And so you see Joshua and Caleb uh, being two of the 12 spies. And Joshua, remember, is going to be a great man of God. Uh, His name, in fact, Joshua, means salvation. Uh, Remember, Jesus is Joshua, uh, the great salvation, our Savior. And so I love this. Again, I've been pointing this out the last couple weeks in the Bible, if you haven't noticed, uh, that names in the Bible mean something. And how amazing to me it is that the names of these people that are given to them at birth, later in their lives, you find them fulfilling their names. Joshua, well, there was nothing really special about Joshua at this point, but boy, is Joshua going to be a picture of salvation to the people. Because who is it, after Moses dies, that is going to lead the people into the promised land? It's Joshua. Who leads the people in the promised land? Who leads us into the promised land? Jesus. Jesus is the one who uh, allows us to enter into our rest or our salvation. Right? What a beautiful, beautiful thing. So Caleb and Joshua, uh, two men that are named here amongst these 12 spies. 
And so verse 17 says, when Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, so here's Moses' directions now, go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities? Is there uh, cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with... Uh, fortifications Uh, how is the land is it fat or is it lean are there trees in it or not make an effort then to go get some of the fruit of the land now the time uh, was the time of the first ripe grapes verse 21 so they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of zen and far as rahab at the lebo hamath when they had gone up into the negev they came to hebron where Ahiman, Shishiah, and Tamali, the descendants of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23. Then they came to the valley of Ishkol, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. So here's Moses giving them their commandments now or their instructions. So go in there and check out the land. Uh, See if there's a lot of trees or there's no trees. See if it's fat or if it's lean, if it's fertile, uh, if there's any fruit. What kind of fruit there is? Is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? Take a look at the cities. You know, are they fortified cities? Are there walls? Are they open cities? Are they heavily populated? What is their military like? Uh, you know, they, they look like they have a pretty strong fighting force, right? And really, so when you think about it from human perspectives, doesn't this sound like a good idea? Doesn't this seem like a pretty reasonable, practical thing to do, Right? I mean, isn't that something we would want to do? You know, we kind of want to lay, get the lay of the land and get the scope and this and that. Well, it's a wise thing to do, but what is a wiser thing to do? Well, the Bible says the wisest man is the man who believes God. Uh, the wisest man of God is wiser than any fool. And so really, the wisest thing to do, the most practical thing to do, the most reasonable thing to do is actually trust God. But we have a way of somehow talking ourselves out of the plans of God. We have a way of wanting to see, touch, taste, and smell the things. We want proof. We want evidence. We want facts, right? Well, what are the facts here? We're going to look at this. What are the true facts? Because you can't believe these witnesses, even these eyewitnesses sometimes. You have to be careful. These people who say, hey, we were there. We saw it. Well, wait a minute. There's 10 witnesses. Why is it that 10 saw one thing and two saw another? They saw the same thing. They moved around in the same little camp. They were there for 40 days. How did they see something different? Or did they see something different? Or was it an issue of the hearts? But see, they had a huge influence on the rest of the nation. So that's why we have to be careful when we think, you know, well, there's 10 of us and two of you, so we're right, you're wrong. Mm. Majority can be majorly wrong. Majorly wrong. When it's going against God's command or what God told them to do, it doesn't matter how many billions of people you have wanting to do something different. What does the Bible say? That let God be true and every man be true. A liar. And so what an amazing thing here. But Moses now sends them out, gives them their instructions, and truly uh, these directions are going to become a subtle manifestation of unbelief. That's what these directions really are. They're subtle manifestations of unbelief. And so this pursuit here, though it seems reasonable, seems practical. In fact, even think of this. They had never seen this land. 
In fact, it had been 400 years since any Israelite had even stepped foot in this land. So again, it gives more credence to, you know, we don't know what we're getting into. It's wise to go in there and check it out first. But again, why I'm emphasizing this point is because Exodus 3.8, if you go all the way back there, when God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush for the first time, even way back then, before God even delivered them from Egypt and showed all these mighty miracles and plagues, uh, the hand of God was with them. The hand of God delivered them. It was even before all of that that God said, guess what? I'm going to save you and I'm going to bring you into this land flowing with milk and honey. You see, God gave them these promises while they were slaves in Egypt. Now they've been delivered and they've been brought through the wilderness and here now they're at the gates, you may say, at the entrance of the promised land and God says, okay, you know, I've been faithful. <laughs> it wasn't you that got yourself out of Egypt. It was me. Uh, here we are now. Now get in there. Go take the land. Don't fear and don't be dismayed. Let me ask you this. Do you think the people thought these spies in the back of their mind well, what if it's a bad report? <laughs> Do you think they thought that? I have to believe that there was already doubt. There was already fear there because you see, God said to go in and take it, but he didn't just throw those two little words in there without any meaning. When he told them, fear not, and don't be dismayed. Why do you think God said that? Because there was going to be things that were going to be fearful in there. God wouldn't have to say, don't fear, if there wasn't something in there that you were going to fear. God knew that they were going to see giants. God knew they were going to see these things. That's why he said, don't fear. But they were full of fear. That's why they even wanted to go in there. And it's funny because I think that you know, when we're already full of unbelief and fear, we're always looking for the downside, aren't we? When we're full of unbelief, if somebody can come and tell us all these good things, but we're always waiting for what? The other shoe to drop. That's fear. It's unbelief. But sometimes we'll count it and credit it to wisdom, right? Discernment. Well, is it? Who's the wisest man? Who's the most discerning man? Uh, the one who is going to believe God's word over their own thoughts, their own beliefs, their own ears, their own eyes. You see, we're challenged and test every day to walk by faith or to walk in unbelief. And so I just always wonder that, you know, what did they think? <laughs> what did they think? Did they think they were going to go in there and it was just going to be thousand percent perfect, you know? Of course not. Is anything a thousand percent perfect? In fact, I see most of all of God's plans being with intense struggle. Intense struggle. Why? Because anything that God is trying to do, there's always going to be opposition to that. There's always going to be things that are going to make you fearful. That's why God would say the same to us. Don't fear and don't be dismayed. If God has brought you to it, what's the old saying? He'll bring you through it, right? If God brings you to it, he's going to bring you through it. Just don't be drugged, kicking and streaming, you know? And so the spies, verse 21, the spies went up and spied out the land and they did see these giants. They saw these big people, these descendants of Anakin or Ankin, but they also saw tremendous pomegranates, tremendous fruit, figs, clusters of grapes, so big of clusters, they put them between a pole and carried them between two guys. And so they brought this back to the promised land. Verse 25 says, when they returned from, uh, from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, then they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them about, um, brought back word to them and to all of the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. I love this. How long were they there in the wilderness or in the promised land spying it out? 
40 days. So this was a pretty thorough investigation. I mean, they did their due diligence. I mean, <laughs> these guys were doing what Moses said. They were getting all the reconnaissance, you know, in and all the information. And it was detailed and they were thorough, right? But this 40 days bit, I love this in the Bible. 40 is an impressive number to me. Because I find in the Bible, I found a few of them and there's more. This number 40, it seems like God uses the number 40 to test his people. You think about 40, it was Moses and Elijah and Jesus who all fasted for 40 days. You think about how long the nation of Israel, because of their unbelief, is wandering in the wilderness. 40 years. 40 seems to be a number of testing Ezekiel, the great prophet, laid on his right side for how long? Forty days. Why did he lay there? To bear the iniquity. Testing. Saul, David, and Solomon, three of the greatest kings of Israel, all reigned for how long? Forty years. Goliath, the Philistine, who taunted Israel for how long? Forty days. They were tested for forty days by that giant. How about this one? How long did God judge the earth the first time? The days of Noah, 40 days and 40 nights. The judgment of God came upon the earth. How about this one? After Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, he walked around on the earth for 40 days until he stood there at the, um, at the mount and was ascended there to the right hand of the Father. And so take that with what you would. But 40 is a very interesting number in the Bible. And so God seems to use that number 40 uh, to test his people. And that's what the spies did. They were there 40 days. And so what do they do? They come back with all of this fruit and all of this produce. and Because what did God tell them? This is a land flowing with milk and honey, right? Uh, there's going to be Excellent produce here. And so they're coming back with that excellent produce. Verse 27 says, Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and that it is fruit. This is its fruit. Here's the evidence, right? So they're believing God's word, because God said that this land is flowing with milk and honey. But you see, they didn't remember the part about God saying, go in and possess it. <laughs> they didn't believe that part. Look at the next verse. Nevertheless, I underline that word. What a horrible word. Right? Here's all the blessings. This is God's promise. For how many years did God promise this? And here it is, the fulfillment of God's promise right before our eyes. It's a miracle. It's amazing. Nevertheless, despite, despite this blessing of God, despite God proving to be true to you and I, nevertheless, they say, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living in the sea, by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Right? So what do they say? Yeah, everything that God said is true, but there's giants in the land. The cities are fortified. It's too big. It's too strong. It's too hard. It's going to be impossible. Right? See, that's why I say, you know, we're pretty good, all of us, are pretty good about believing half of what God says. But that part that involves our action, involves our faith, is usually the one where we're pretty good about convincing ourselves of the circumstances, of the environment. Yeah, God, you're true. Yeah, yeah, you brought me here, God, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to get me all the way through. And so the spy's report here is, that it is what God said. It is flowing with milk and honey. This word nevertheless really means despite all of that. 
In other words, it's a slap really in God's face. It says, despite God's faithful promises, the people are too strong. Despite God's faithful promises, the cities are fortified. Despite God's faithful promises, the giants live there. Despite God's faithful promises, the land is taken up. There's no room for us. And to me, as we're reading this, right, about other people, not us, it has to seem to be pretty hard to imagine this report. It seems like a pretty unfaithful, unbelieving group of people. God's truth was given to them, but despite that, they found reasons to not trust him, to not believe him. But verse 30, here we go. Here's one of the two spies, Caleb. says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means take up, uh, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Stop for a minute right there. What courage this man Caleb has. Think about that. You got 10 guys that are ready to shoot you down, right? And, and slap you around and intimidate you because they're all living in unbelief. But Caleb is speaking out against the unbelief. Not so much them. He's speaking out against the unbelief. What does he say? Let's go up. Wait a minute. Did he come up with that idea? No, God did. God was the one who said, go up. And what did he say? We surely will possess it. Why did he come up with that? No, because God said, fear not and don't be dismayed. I have given you this land. So really, the courage of Joshua or Caleb here is simply to speak out against this unbelief, right? He's reminding the people what God said, and that should quiet the people. But did it quiet the people? Well, Look at the next verse. Verse 31 says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report. Remember what we read in Deuteronomy? Same thing. A bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants <laughs> and all the people whom we saw in the in it are men of great size there also we saw the nephilim the sons of anak are part of the nephilim and we came to be like grasshoppers in our own sight there's the problem and we were in their sight in other words we're doomed the land is going to devour us. The giants are going to consume us like grasshoppers. Right? What did the Bible say in Deuteronomy? They melted the people's hearts away. The people were encouraged and were being blessed with the promises of God. And here they are at the doorsteps of the promised land. It's ready for the climax of all of this. But what do these ten spies come back with? This message of unbelief and fear. And it caused the people's hearts to melt away. What a sad, sad day. That's why I say in Romans 3, verse 4, here's where Caleb gets a big shout out. Because Caleb believed God over these other men that he was there shoulder to shoulder with. They saw the same things together, but Caleb had the courage to say, God gave it to us. We need to not fear and not be dismayed. We need to take it. Romans 3, 4. Very clearly says, let God be true. And every man be a liar. And so these response of the others in verse 31. See, this is why I say we have to be careful uh, with the witness and the testimony of others. Because their response here is a very unbelieving response. But notice, what makes it unbelieving is it's mixed with both truth and lies. And this is what's always fascinating to me because there's always a mix of truth and lies there. Their response here is very potent and it's a potent combination of truth and lies. And that's really what unbelief is. It's a combination, it's a mixture, it's a potent combination 
of truth and lies. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a couple things that they said. This is a true statement that they said from a human's perspective. That these people were bigger and stronger than us. Okay, that's true. But of that statement, where's the lie? Well, the lie is when they said, we are not able to go up against them. See, it's a mixture of truth and lie. Yes, they are bigger than us. But the lie is, is that you're not able to go up against them. Wait a minute, didn't God say, fear not, don't be dismayed. I've given you this land. Stronger is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I will go before you. I will drive them out. So to say that they are bigger than you and stronger than you is true, but the lie is when they say, we're not able. And be careful when we start saying things like, we're not able. Maybe we're not, but God is. God is able. And so in God being able, he enables us. If God is leading us to it, he's going to lead us through it. So see how it's a mix of lies and truth? How about this one? It was true that they went into the promised land. They were there. They're eyewitnesses. That's what they even said, uh, that they were there. Uh, the land through which we have gone. You other guys haven't seen it yet. We have gone through it. We've spent 40 days in there. We've seen it. That's true. But where's the lie at in there? You notice when, it sa when they said that the land devours its inhabitants? In other words, your fear and your unbelief needs to be exaggerated and inflated to win your position. That's what they're doing. The land devours its people. What is it? The Brea Tar Pits? The land devours its inhabitants. That's a lie. You see, when they said all of these giants, they were all giants. See, that's the fearful position, right? We, we see all of them as giants. They were all giants, and we're just little grasshoppers. Tell me that these aren't terribly exaggerated. That the cities were fortified to heaven? Isn't that a little bit of an exaggeration? Well, you see, what they're trying to do is persuade everyone to not go into the promised land. The scarier, the more fearful, the bigger, the more dangerous. We need to stay out of there. Well, remember what God said. God said, I've given it to you. <laughs> it's a blessing of mine. Remember in Deuteronomy when the people even said, God has brought us out here to kill us. God doesn't love us. Wow. Wow, how sad. And so here's the thing in verse 32 when it says, the land that we went through. This is where you have to be careful. These are the eyewitnesses. We've been there. We've done that. We know better. We are coming off as very factual. We're coming off as very practical. We're coming off as very down to earth. Wait a minute. What is the most factual? What is the most practical? What is the most down to earth? God's word or man's word? Well, what did the Bible say? Let God be true and every man be a liar. So this is something that we have to understand. You want factual, you want practical, you want down to earth, God's word. God's word is the truth without any lie. That is the most practical. That is the most down to earth. And that is the most factual. But the most factual and practical and down to earth is just that. It's the word of God. And so though these people were trying to base their unbelief on facts, really, all of their facts were not facts at all. They were mixed with truth and lies. All to do what? To convince the people to be as full of fear and unbelief as they were. And so here's where I close, because this is where it just boggles me, because it's the same in life today. Of these 12 men, think about it, a little cohort, cohort, right? They slept next to each other for those 40 days. They saw exactly the same thing. They experienced the same thing. They heard the same things. They, they, they saw everything the same, right? Can we all agree with that? So then how can one or two, we know it's two, but at least one here, Caleb, 
comes away from this experience singing and oozing in faith. And the other ten come away filled with a sense of doom. It's what they even said. God's brought us out here to die. This is hell. We're better off in Egypt. Doom. One comes out of this, or two, I might argue, come out beaming in faith, oozing in faith, singing in faith, seeing the same things. And the other ten are filled with this certain, I love this, certain sense of doom. (laughs) You see, that's why my point that I started with, that ultimately faith and unbelief, they don't spring up from circumstances. They don't spring up from our environment. No, they spring up from the heart. That's the difference. They saw the same thing. They were in the same environment. Everything was the same. The only thing that was different was the faith came out of two of the hearts and the unbelief came out of the other ten. That's the only difference. Because how else do you explain it? They saw the same things. You see, what does God need to work on in us? The heart. (laughs) We have to have those hearts of faith like Caleb and Joshua who said, you know what? I see giants all over Tehachapi (laughs) or maybe the United States. I see horrible things. I see walls all the way to heaven. You know, it's impossible. It's hard. The things I hear, the things I smell. But what does God's word say? What does God's word say? Well, what am I going to believe? What am I going to believe? What am I going to trust? Let God be true and every man be a liar. But it's only going to be me. Well, guess what? It was only Caleb. It was only Caleb against those other 10 who apparently snuffed them out, right? Not snuffed them out, but basically convinced the people to believe them instead of Caleb and Joshua. Oh, well, right? We're not here to convince the multitudes. We're here to do what? To believe God uh, to have that faith come out of our hearts. And if we can influence a few people along, along the way, praise God. But to say that we're going to influence the whole world and the whole world is going to bow their knees to Jesus and surrender to Jesus and it's going to be heaven on earth, show me that in the Bible. I don't think it ends that way. <laughs> That's not how it ends. There may be a revival, but a global, worldwide, you know, that'll happen when the Antichrist comes, but it's going to be done out of fear. It's going to be out of either you're going to lose your head or you're going to worship me. But no, when it's left up to man and and we're given choices, see, that's what all this is. These are opportunities and circumstances for what's in our heart to come out. Remember, the millions of people that were laid low in the wilderness, not because God judged them, (laughs) because God was some meanie up there. No, God gave them a whole lifetime. Chance after chance after chance. He showed them his faithfulness. He gave them his promises. He loved them. He even forgave them time and time again. Remember how angry he was with them at one point and was ready to strike them dead? But God did what? He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's merciful. But at the end of the day, it's what's in your heart. We're going to either believe God and love God and trust God or we're not. We're either going to walk in faith or we're going to walk in unbelief. A choice is ours. And so really, at the end of the day, it's, it's God giving us what we want. Isn't that what it is? It's God giving us, he's, he's given us uh, the blessings and the curses. Right? He's given us Jesus or he's given us our own way. The choice is ours. And at the end of the day, if people reject Jesus and God's salvation, it's their choice. The way I see it, though God is still sovereign, God knows who's there, who's not there. But within God's sovereign will, there is the here and now. There's the opportunity for us to prove what is in our hearts. God already knows it. This is our opportunity to prove what is in our heart. And so day by day, remember what Hebrews 11 says. Hebrews 11, 1, I'm just going to read this to close. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Bummer. (laughs) I'm like Thomas. I'm like, I'll believe it when I see it. Jesus says, okay, here it is. Touch and see. It is me. For by it, the men of old gained approval. Wow. 
So how do I gain approval before God? Uh, faith. You mean i got to believe it before I can see it? By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Interesting. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gift, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. I love that. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness, he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Here it is, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him who is God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And you can go on and on. Chapter 11 is a powerful chapter all about faith and all the men and women, women too, who believed God and it was accredited to them as faith. Rahab's mentioned in there. Sarah's mentioned in there. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why is that? Well, because by faith, we're having to trust and believe God. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes because we know what we see. We know what we've done a million times. But yet, God says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. And... If you can muster up the courage to believe me, guess what? I'm not going to leave you short hanging. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. Because see, faith is a gift also, isn't it? I believe the more that we trust God, the more we see God's faithfulness, faithfulness the more our faith increases. Not that God's miracles makes our faith, but as I trust him, as I believe him, and God is a rewarder of those who, who seek him through faith, then that begins to say, well, you know what? I want to do that again next time. I'm not going to say it gets any easier. You guys know that as well as I do. It's always going to be a test of faith. Sometimes it's big faith. Sometimes it's little faith. But guess what? It's faith. And without it, it's impossible to please God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word here tonight. And, and just thank you, God, for... Your faithfulness, God, though we can sometimes be miserably faithless, we thank you that you always remain faithful. And so thank you for these opportunities, even when we are faithless, Lord, that we still have an opportunity to say, Father, forgive me. Just like Peter, uh, who was, O ye of little faith, God, will you probably say that of me every day? <laughs> o ye of little faith. And so, God, I, I pray that as I continue to muster up the courage to step out in faith and to believe you, that you are true, and every man be a liar, that we depend on you, we trust in you. Lord, and as we do, I thank you that you are a great rewarder of those steps of faith. And so, Father, I pray that the greatest reward of those steps of faith would be an increase of faith. Lord, that each and every time... We would grow stronger and stronger in our faith to where then I pray in my life that it would become automatic. I don't know that's possible, but with you, all things are possible. But that's the goal, Father, to be like Enoch, to be in so, such close fellowship and trust with you that uh, you're so close that you just took him up, <laughs> took him up in his earthly body and he was there uh, in your presence, God. He was translated on the way up is the picture. But what an amazing thing, Father. And so, Lord, bless us as we go. Watch over us. You know what each and every one of us are dealing with or battling with or encountering. Whatever it is, God, may we see it tonight as just simply a test, Father, that we're either going to lean on you and trust in you or we're going to look to our own devices or we're going to listen to the reports of those who we probably shouldn't be listening to a mixture of lie and truth, Father. So help us, as Jesus would say, that we would be wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. And I believe the wisest thing we could do is to look to your word, look to your word that makes even the fool 
appear to be wise. And Father, we are very foolish when it comes to the things of you. And so, Father, I just pray that you would bless us, Lord. Uh, help us, God. There's a lot of sickness going around. Help my throat, God, that has been scratchy for a week now. Lord, I pray for um, anyone else who's ailing, Lord, that you would just continue to bring healing, Lord, and um, bless our families, uh, bless our coworkers, our loved ones. And we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Excellent word. Uh, the, one of the phrases that came to mind listening to the sermon was, uh, we, we always say seeing is believing, but really hearing is believing. It's, you know, we, we, the, the hearing of the word is what's, what spurns the faith. And uh, that, that could come by reading the Bible, reading it silently or reading it out loud. But it's, it's really hearing that builds our faith. Seeing doesn't do much for us. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing Alleluia! Christ is risen! Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing Alleluia, Christ is risen. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Go in peace and we'll see you on Sunday. Love you guys.